Welcome to Sparks of Love. Um, my name is Jerry Sparks, and we are exploring love and um, my search for it in all its different forms. Um, I have my guest today, Alex Zaposochny. Um, this is part two of our conversation. And this part, we're going to talk about the good marriages that Alex has seen um, and his family. So um, welcome, Alex. Thank you. Good to be back. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking this morning before uh, I called you, because I talked to Alex a lot, he's a good friend of mine, how can I live with someone again? I have been living alone for the past 11 and a half years. And when I say alone, my kids are at the house until the last two years. A lot can happen in two years time. Um, so I have now mornings when I wake up and there's no bus to catch and, and I have fun with that. So my friends that are younger still doing that race and my kids miss the bus all the time. I think my daughter's senior year, I literally drove her every single day and I cried when she graduated because that was over. But now when the bus comes by at like this God, you know, ungodly hour at 6.15, I'm sitting in my recliner, I got the fireplace going, I got my coffee and I just cheer the neighbors running their kids to the bus. Like, I don't miss that part. But then I started thinking, well, do I miss the parts about having someone in the bed beside me or having someone who, you know, I'm responsible for? I've been responsible for four humans for a really long time and in some ways still am. But now my house is quiet when I walk in and it's a magical thing. Like when I leave something, when I get back home, it's still there. <laughs> like, can I live with someone again? And and so I started thinking about, do I have the tools anymore to welcome someone into my life, to let myself be altered by their sculpting tool. And then I thought, well, if I'm going to have a relationship, a romantic relationship, I need to learn, you know, about good marriages. And so you're, you have an interesting family history. So I thought you could talk with me about that and let me learn from, you know, those good relationships you had growing up. Sure. And, and in the last segment, we talked about the fact that a lot of things – uh, in terms of how we conceive them or what, how we appreciate them, they tend to come out of things we've seen and experienced in in childhood. Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, when you ask that question, I mean, the marriages I obviously saw in childhood, that of my parents, uh, but also that of, of each of my grandparents. So I was born in the, in the former Soviet Union. Um, and there, actually, when I was growing up until I was age seven, my grandparents, I mean, we were we were among the, the lucky, wealthy ones that actually, you know, that, that had uh, only two sets of family, right? So we, we had my grandparents living in the bedroom next door, and my parents, actually, I slept in the same bedroom as them. I didn't you know, know that. Oh, well, yeah, Soviet Union, you know, everything yeah. is everything is a little bit more compact. Yeah. Um, and I love Alex's parents. He has a great family. Thank you. And, and then, of course, my, my, my father's parents. Uh, parents while they weren't there. I mean, I was certainly very aware of them and I, I you know, I, I thought about them and it wasn't just in childhood, obviously, you know, these are uh, in many ways become sort of the models of how you think mm -hmm. of love, yeah. of family. Um, so, I mean, you know, I could get going maybe with either one. So I think that the one thing that came across very clearly to me in childhood is that family is really meant to be, uh, or, or within families, you can truly be, you know, yourself. Uh, family are the only people you can kind of really rely on. In many ways, that's a theme that's not alone to me, you right? You can I rely mean, on me, don't thank you? you? Don't thank ever you. doubt well, well, in the Soviet <laughs> Union, uh, while, look, friendships are, are important and people were friends, um, especially during those many decades where people had to worry about being, you know, turned into authorities and yeah. things like that, People took their inner circle very, very seriously, like yeah. who was in that. And they were very distrustful, naturally, for all sorts of good reasons hmm. about people they didn't know very well. That's and maybe part of when you say when you're meeting Katie, oh, I don't know these people very well. Maybe that got ingrained in you. You ever think about that? Uh, no, but I'll give it some thought after yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in a minute. But as a result of that, I, I, and it's not like this is a universal. There are plenty of people in the Soviet Union who had dysfunctional families. And, you know, so it's not like as though it's a magic thing, nor, do, nor am I saying it's a good thing to be, right. you know, politically oppressed because it brings families together. It just happens to have been sort of a, you know, a side benefit, if you will, in, in our family is that. Um, in both side, on both sides of the family, the families are extremely close, right? Mm -hmm. Those were the people you could truly rely on. Mm -hmm. And therefore, and I sort of very much felt that uh, growing up. 
family was around all the time and it was pretty much only family. I mean, extended family, cousins and all sorts of other things. Yeah. But 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 everywhere I, I looked, I mean, I, I, I saw mm-hmm. family members, I saw people laughing, being themselves. Then, in, again, the Soviet Union, when people would walk out the door of their apartments uh, and walk outside, you would immediately see their face go into something much more, you know, no smiling. People mm-hmm. don't smile in the streets, only so-called idiots smile in the streets. Like, like I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, people... Mm-hmm. Put on a mask, basically, okay. and so for me, I, you know, I think I grew up really associating family with okay, these are the people who, authenticity. These yeah. are the people you can really rely on, mm. and certainly I saw that over and over, not just in childhood, but really throughout my my life with, with my family. So in terms of my my grandparents, I mean, I can start off with um, perhaps my father's parents. So my father's parents had a very uh, each of them had a unique uh, history. Uh, my grandmother uh, orphaned relatively early in life. She was actually born in in Poland, mm-hmm. uh, a little bit outside of Warsaw. Uh, grew up in, in 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 an orphanage. I mean, had a sister, had a grandmother, but the grandmother kind of you know couldn't really take care of her. Um, and so you know, you would think that there might be some issues associated right. with that. Uh, uh, but she actually grew up in an orphanage that was quite famous. Um, uh, and very loving, like it was like a true community mm. and society. In fact, it was so much so that a she— A loving orphanage. I never loving, would put those two together. Well, there's Interesting. a— Yeah, so there was actually a very famous um, pediatrician and children's author in Poland by the name of Dr. Janusz Korzak. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he's, you know, well-known, well, kind of world-renowned, I mean, for, for, for those who— We studied uh, him at UCLA in well, our child so, development. So he is child development. He's yeah. well-known for that because he really observed all the kids yeah. and kind of, you know, wrote all sorts of books. He was also really the first person, oftentimes credited as the first person who really pushed for children's rights as human rights. Yeah, and there's, I don't think that's still ever passed. So when I was at UCLA, that was one of the things, the international rights of the child, I don't think it's ever been passed. So yes, and so he his documents are somewhat you know considered okay. somewhat foundational for for, okay. for some of those efforts, uh, but it was like a loving uh, a loving nice. place, and I think that certainly affected her. Uh, she eventually made her way over to the Soviet uh, Union, mm-hmm. um, and uh, but because she was a foreigner, once uh, kind of Stalin's forces started. Um, to trying to take out all the supposed enemies, pretty much everybody who was a foreigner and he didn't like. Polish people were were you know killed or sent away. In her case, she was sent away to a Siberian labor camp. Oh my god! Uh, my grandfather was going through something somewhat uh, analogous at the time. He actually got married when he was pretty young, had a child. Is he in Poland but, or Soviet no? He's he was uh, at, at that point. He was in Ukraine when okay. uh, like in, in, where I'm kind of talking about my story. Uh, but you know he had said things in college where they're you know they were debating politics and so people get on lists and so mm. he was basically pulled out as a you know. Uh, like pulled out of his home and sent to Siberia as well, independently, you know, had to, uh, his wife and child didn't know what happened to him. They assumed uh, that he had been quite likely killed. And so they both ended up at this Siberian labor camp for for quite a few years, trying to survive, you know, barely doing so, eventually managing to survive. And they met when my grandfather had gotten out. But when you get out, you couldn't like go anywhere else. And Mm -hmm. so you still kind of had to live in this, in this town, just on the other side of the wire. Wow. Uh, and so, um, and my grandmother was a nurse in Poland, and so she'd become a nurse in the in the Siberian labor camp. And so my grandfather was sick, he had to go and uh, have some sort of, you know, me- medical person look at him and met my grandmother as a result. Freaky. They stayed in touch. Somehow they dated. I don't know how that works within, you know, yeah. the context of a labor camp, but, but somehow they dated. Yeah. Somehow they stayed together. And when wow. she got out a while later, they got together on the other side, on the free side of the, of, of the barbed wire. Uh, and and started uh, a family. It's like a movie. It's it's kind of like a movie. Yeah. Um, and so my father was born uh, in that Siberian labor camp town. So it was my uncle. Boris was born in the Siberian labor uh-huh. camp. Yeah. Folks, he was a violinist at the RPO. What an amazing story. Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. And so. I never knew that. Yeah. And um, one can imagine, maybe from books, movies, etc., that life in Siberia um, is probably not the easiest thing, yeah. right? So you can probably imagine how much people rely on their family and how the family unit becomes yeah. something extremely uh, valued. Mm-hmm. I, I think, you know, to, to a large extent, that's that that's w- what happened. Uh, and really all my life, I mean, and this kind of goes to both of my parents. For instance, like whenever anybody was sick, whenever one of my grandparents was, was sick or mm-hmm. had an issue, uh, my parents were kind of 
not just there, but like wouldn't leave them, right? Like, yeah. so every time, like every single time any of my grandparents were ever in the hospital, my yeah. parents would basically pull all nighter every night, oh. no matter what, wouldn't leave. Because, you know, especially in America, God forbid, you know, because my grandparents didn't speak English well enough that yeah. they wouldn't be there to translate both like on the language side, but also just, you know, making yeah. sure that they were okay. I mean, so so to me, like a lot of my, like all, so many of those memories are, okay, my parents always did whatever they could for They modeled their how to care and how to love for oh you my guys. Goodness. Oh, my goodness. As, I remember one time, um, I know your family, and I was sick at work, and your brother like was so like nurturing and caring. I'm like, who is this man? Like I never seen anything. I just had a cold or something, but it was just so sweet. And I never, now it's given context to that. Yeah. You know, people, um, you know, small diseases <laughs> wiped out people in the Soviet Union. Yeah. So everybody took like any sort of, you know, uh, even mild sickness somewhat seriously, yeah. but especially if something major was happening, you're in the hospital, like if it required that sort of care. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were all there, and my parents especially just would not leave their 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 parents aside. So, so, so of course that 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 affected me quite a bit. I mean, I'll I'll kind of jump in on, on on one thing on my mother's side of the family. Ms. So Helen, my, that's yes, and so uh, her parents. Um, uh, I mean, as I mentioned, they lived in the bedroom next to us for the first seven years when I was living in the Soviet Union. But when we all got here for the first time in our life, you know, we had a separate place. But it was like, you know, you like were eight, a, right? Yeah, but we were a couple miles apart, basically. Yeah. So they were a daily presence in, in, in our lives. And um, at one point, my grandmother, at uh, this, this point, I was already in my, my, in my tw uh, 20s, um, uh, had a stroke. Mm -hmm. And she had your mother's mother, my mother's mother. Mm -hmm. And um and it, it, she was paralyzed as a result um, it, 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 from the way we were kind of, you know, raised and the way we thought. And the only conceivable choice was, okay, like, of course, we're going to take care of her. Yeah. And so my mother moved her, her own mother into our house. She was, like, in our family room, yeah. paralyzed for four and a half years. Wow. And, I never knew this either. And, and every day, my grandfather, he, you know, he was an artist, continued to go to work yeah. every day. But he Great would. Great artist. Yes, and he would uh, come to our house every single day, and he would sit there and he'd hold her hand, he'd talk with her, and just just keep her company for for hours and hours. I didn't know you were going to make me cry so much oh, today. I, Dad, blame it. Well, no, but look, we're talking about love. Like, what is love? I mean, ah. love is the kind of you know, it's love isn't just you know, oh, so and so is beautiful. You love, know. This is love as service. But this, not out of um, a burden because you, you This is love you because you, you legitimately, you legitimately care, care about a human being. And yeah. you want them to feel as good as they can feel. You want them to be as happy as they can yeah. be. And whatever you need to do to do that, you know, generally, you, you, you know, you, you do it. Now It's like that Corinthians thing. I wrote this down before I came here. Like, I don't know if you know it because you're, um, you know. I don't know. You're not religious, but anyway, this is. I, I wrote this down at the one Corinthians thirteen verses four through eight. I did this as my research. Mm -hmm. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love is not pompous. It is not inflated. Love is not rude. It does not seek its own interests. It is not quick tempered. It does not brood over injury, and does not rejoice over the wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So that was actually, I mean, you didn't obviously know this, but that was a reading from my wedding. I did not, I did not know that. <laughs> so I'm very familiar okay, with it. Okay, so I now really cry. Yeah, yeah. I told you this was supposed to be fun, and here I am, like, crying like a... Well, I'm <laughs> having fun watching you cry. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You have to have tissues in here, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. We'll have to make sure. So, so, I mean, so those were the things I grew up seeing, um, experiencing. Um, I mean, with kind of going back for a minute to my, my father's side of the family. I mean, so my grandparents, um, my father's parents, when, they, when we all moved, they ended up actually going to Israel as opposed to the United States. Mm -hmm. But they would come and visit us usually for basically six months at a time. Uh, and my, my grandmother actually passed away when, when, when she was visiting here. And this is your father's my mother. My father's mother. Um, and I was actually happened to be the only one at the hospital, you know, when, when she passed away. How old were you? Uh, 18. Uh, 18. 17. Mm. And um, so, you know, I called my father. And then together we went to tell my grandfather. And, you know, one of the memories that's never going to leave me is seeing the pain in his eyes when he learned 
uh, that his wife had passed. Mm. And and so, you know, when we talk about, you know, the depths of love, what does it mean? I mean, yes, it's so much of it is about what you've seen mm-hmm. and what you've what's been modeled for you. Yes. And I mean, and, and so there's no doubt to me that seeing the in many ways, the way that my grandparents had love for each other and their families, the way seeing the way my parents who've been together since they were 17, well, they met when they were 17 and 15. Mm. They got married three years later when my, my mom was 18. My father was, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, 20 uh, at the time uh, and have been together ever since. I mean, seeing all those things and especially seeing the sacrifice. Now, just to be clear, like, there are people who can take it too far, I suppose. Like, like I understand from a psychological principle standpoint, there is that there are some people uh, that uh, become so selfless in reality because it becomes part of their personality. That's not Code necessarily right. well, right? That's not necessarily a good thing. Like, yeah. it's not a good thing to become so selfless or, or so uh, everything or to, to in moderation, to, right? Yes, but like, if if you have kind of true deep love, I mean, it should be pretty obvious and and mm-hmm. and it's usually obvious when the when somebody truly when, when somebody needs you yeah. and for me yes over and over i i saw that and probably as i said i mean it being the soviet union definitely i think uh, added to that because of that sense of family is everything even coming here and and kind of growing up initially i mean i was americanized relatively quickly i mean over over the first few years but still i mean there was a sense of separation from the rest of the world and so i probably focused a little bit more inwardly on family Mm -hmm. uh, than maybe some others would have and isn't that true of first generation second generation then it starts to dissipate as they become more acclimated into the culture yep that's true (laughs) no no of course and and by the way there's nothing wrong with that i mean it's you know everybody has like a different uh starting point and but but for me i think it reinforced in, in various ways that that family is really critical and, you know, I mentioned in, in, in our last segment that when I saw Katie for the first time really interacting, when she came to visit me, when we still weren't overly, right. you know, serious, but yeah. when she came to visit and Katie, I saw wife. that, yep. yeah, now my wife, I mean, that was a very big moment for me. In mm-hmm. fact, that was the weekend that I first told her that I loved her. Oh, really? Yes. Aww. And and I, you the know. The fact I, that you remember that is sweet, too. It, it is. I, I didn't necessarily remember that that was the reason, but it was. Yeah, but, but but it. Yeah. But how could it not have been? It wasn't yeah. my plan to. Yeah. Uh, but seeing her, you know, interacting with family and seeing, um, and, and therefore being reminded of how family oriented she is, because that's mm-hmm. where it was coming from. I could tell, and this is. You're really, going to give her this as a Christmas gift this episode. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but but I could tell that when she was interacting with my family, she wasn't doing it just to impress. I mean, yeah. she wasn't it was sitting authentic. there. It was authentic. Oh, yeah. I mean, she, in fact, she wasn't even, well, and the reason I know it wasn't just to impress is because she wasn't kind of talking about herself yeah. or you know, career or any of this other yeah. stuff. She really just wanted to get to know them as people. She was asking, like, deeper level questions, yeah. which uh, so, which surprised me because it was it's just not the usual thing you do when you get to know somebody. Yeah. I could tell she really wanted to understand yeah. them. Well, you know, I and, saw. And that really meant so much to me. We were at a cookout uh, when you and I were working together. Um, at the second place we worked together. We worked together at the paper, but when we're at iCardiac, there was like a party of some sort at that park, Ellison Park, I think it was. And I think Helen and Katie were there, and I just observed the way they were. It was like Katie was Helen's daughter. And at one point, I think, if I'm not remembering incorrectly, I think Katie called her mama or something. Like, she used that term. I was like, that is close. Like, I never called my mother-in-law mama or anything like that. I didn't have, because she was very reserved. But my in-laws, so my father-in-law had grown up one child, and his mother was 40 back in the day. That was unheard of for a woman to have a kid. And every time he got sick, she was became like a hypochondriac and took him to the hospital. Like, oh, my God, you know, because it was her one kid, and she had him at 40. There was no chance for her to ever have another kid. And but it was a form of care, but she took it to that extreme, like you talked about the sickness part. Um, but with my my mother in law, she was the oldest of I think five, and it was a dysfunctional parents that she had, and so she was Norwegian, and she always claimed that the culture of the Norwegian culture um, was more austere and didn't really verbally express love, didn't hug, didn't say I love you to the children, and and like I tend to do as one does, watch Hallmark last night. It was an episode about um, Norwegian love at Christmas time, and he even said in the 
movie repeatedly, they referenced how Norwegians don't do that. I'm like, oh, so it wasn't her just BSing me. This was true. This is something in that culture. And so my ex-husband grew up with his two sisters, their mother not saying I love you to them and not hugging them. And she loved them so much I could tell, but she just didn't express it. And so when I married him, I come from this big, loving Southern you know, family where the Sparks family are just like you described as your, your Russian family very much. They all live right around each other. I grew up with 40 cousins all the time. And anytime I needed something from school, if I had, I remember having chicken pox and my grandma Sparks just put me on their couch and she took care of me the whole time. And the whole cousins were there. And every time I go home to this day, it's a big event. Like they come, they want to see me. And we had two parties when I was home in August and October. So two parties each time, that loving family. On my mother's side, there's um, more of that austerity. They do love each other, but it's much more of an austerity thing. So I had kind of a mix of that, um, but the the father in law and the mother in law, like the way that they raised their children, which is you know who my husband, his parents were, he and I would have conflicts sometimes because he didn't say that, and his answer to me would always be fiddler on the roof. I'm like, why don't you say this? He would just go fiddler on the roof. Well, I'd never seen fiddler on the roof. I didn't know what he was talking about. And to this day, well, I've what, not. What was he talking about? Um, what was he trying to talk about? That's he was trying to say, and I have yet to watch it. I know I need to watch it. He was trying to say that it's the things that I do for you that show you my love, not the things that I say, which is true. Actions are much more impactful. But I was trying to say to him, it's kind of both that you're not doing. Not that I'm highly needy or anything, but there was um, his definition of, of love was not what I would like to see. But he did have a good model. His parents they very much loved each other. I don't know why it didn't take with him. Like, it took with you. I can tell you and your brothers it took. So some of it, you know, you can model as much as you want to, but the student has to be able to absorb it. And it, you know, wasn't the case with him. And I don't particularly think his his siblings, you know, were very different than their parents. That austerity, you know, is kind of there in, in certain things that I've seen, but they're they do love there's that capacity to love that his siblings but with my kids they were showered with love to the point that my my mother-in-law said it's really interesting like how you're always hugging and kissing and loving on your kids i just so uncomfortable with that i'm like well i'm not like my kids like when we would get you know them on to the bus they would say i love you i love you and to this day we don't end a single phone call or text without I love you. You know, we still, we have the family thread going on. I'm trying to get them into Wordle with me, you know, competing with me. But we have the family text thing going on. And we always have that I love you there, but we also have that action. Like my daughter flew in just for Jared's welcome back party, all the way from L.A., just for his party. That's love. She had a lot going on. She's in studio. She had things going on, but she she did that care, even with the distance, you know, across the continent. I I mean, I think you're right that it's... um it's a number of things. I mean, I think that words and hugs are important. Actions are important. I mean, I think if you were to kind of summarize that, uh, consistency is important, right? I mean, in fact, when they kind of look at people who have trouble with love, oftentimes it wasn't that they didn't have a loving family or whatever. They just couldn't rely on it like every day in the long term. Like that's oftentimes like what kind of makes people very- That's the most reinforced. Did you know that? There's an addiction study. So I was, uh, I studied addiction at UCLA, which is interesting because I married an addict. How do you like that for some Freudian stuff for you? Mm -hmm. Um, But we had worked in a rat lab. I also worked in human lab, but we started in the rat lab. And the most reinforcing schedule to get a a creature or a human addicted to something is unpredictability. So if you give um, the rat sugar water every single time, pretty soon they're going to take it for granted. And they're just not going to rush to the feeder because like, oh, I can get it tomorrow. But if you only give it an unpredictable schedule, they don't know when they're going to get it. And so they go in there. And so you think about the man who, or in my case, let's just use the gender norms here for this. The, the man that I used to be like crazy about, part of it was I didn't know how consistent he was going to be. Is he going to follow through this time? Or actually, are we really going to go out? Are we really going to do this? And it made me addicted. And it took me a long time to like tease apart like what was going on. I don't think they did it consciously. I think it was just 
their unpredictable behavior. But that's where we give that moniker bad boys to. And it makes you, you almost feel like you've got a contest and you're going to be the winner. Like I'm going to like earn his love. I'm going to be the one, the chosen one. I don't feel that way anymore. I want that's consistent. Good. I want good. consistency. Well, I've, I've and grown. Consistency, and, and consistency is boring in some ways. But it's, but it's it, so important I mean, in everything, I mean, in at work, of, in friendships. In, in, in everything. I can count on you. I know that if I call you Alex or if I text you Alex, it's something really emergent. You're going to consistently be there for me. And the same is true for my kids. I'm going to be there for them. And even at work, like you're a CEO of a company, like if you were to be an inconsistent CEO, you would have attrition at work. People, that's a relationship, by the way, employer to employee. I wouldn't say that it's love, but it's a relationship. And your consistency is what makes people feel connected and dedicated right. and devoted. Well, and, and, the clo- and the more important the relationship, the more I think consistency is important. Yes. And consistency, one requires that you... Uh, aren't just sort of good at action, good at words. I mean, you you really care about that person. You want them to feel good and loved and seen and heard. Yes. And so therefore you do the work of figuring out what that means to them. Because mm-hmm. for some people, words are particularly important and you want to do that. In some cases, it may be something else. It's just actions. But you figure it out because you care, right? I mean, yeah. I think that's sort of the basis of um, of, of, of a truly loving relationship. And mm. that is, you know, we kind of talked in the last segment about, um, like, what's the filter that people use? Yeah. I think the filter that people should really use involves, okay, this is somebody who is willing to do the work, really wants the work mm-hmm. of getting to know me. Yeah. And then we'll do on a consistent basis the things that really demonstrate that. And there's not contempt either. So one of the things I noticed with your parents, with Boris and Helen, like when they go to parties, they won't like suffocate each other. They're, she she wanders and mingles over there. He usually sits on a chair. I love talking to your dad. I, you said something like everybody in your family just like absolutely you know loves talking to Boris. He's interesting. He's he's that quiet magnet. My mother's interesting too. In case she she's is. watching this, yeah, she yeah. is very interesting. Yes, yes. Helen will make herself like known and she's much more like extroverted, I think, where Boris is a violinist. He'll sit in the corner and you're just drawn to go talk to him. And he he, he owns that. But there was this uh, and I'd like to go back to friends. You know, there's an episode where they're going to England for Ross's wedding to Emily. Mm-hmm. And there's this hilarious couple that they had on there. Emily's parents, I think it was. And they do not get along. They don't like each other. They are like the Costanza's on Seinfeld. And he was late. The husband was late getting to something. And he goes, I'm here. I'm here. She goes, and the wife goes, yes, there you are. <laughs> like, And I just like, that contempt is what destroys things. And I remember um, when I was in a couples counseling with my ex-husband, by this point, he had, you know, he had cheated on me and I was just done. I really, I wanted a divorce right then and there. And he was threatening me about taking the house and taking the kids. I didn't want to be in therapy. And he said something that was so self-serving. I just rolled my eyes and the therapist called me out on it. He's like, that is contempt. And we don't have rolling our eyes here. We can be honest with each other, but contempt destroys marriages. And I got really mad at the therapist because I'm like, I am being my authentic pissed off self right here. And he's like, we can do it in more constructive ways. He goes, but we can, he said there's some kind of study that shows the number of eye rolls that people mm-hmm. have when they're doing shows whether or not they're going to stay together. And I did right. a lot of eye rolls because I literally was done. I was done at that point. Because well, usually people are eye rolling when they've kind they're of done. Give, given up on the person, right? I had, and I had, eye rolling is just like, look, it's a disrespect thing because it's not even Well, I was being point, disrespected. Like, I, would, I yeah. was no longer going to have the wool pulled over my eyes. I've never seen your parents do that. And I've never seen you and Katie do that with each other. There's just in noticeable love there's not contempt there and by the way that doesn't mean that people can't argue and disagree and you know in fact it's probably healthier to disagree rather than well it's definitely yes, healthier rather than to disagree it. rather than you know let things that are important uh not be addressed not mm-hmm. be unsaid i don't want to and maybe this goes back to, to that point that love is real work um just like all other things in life which are worth doing are real work uh, but but if you care about something if you care about the outcome, in, in this case, I mean, what is the outcome? The outcome is, do you feel connected to the world? Because yeah. that's really what love is. Mm-hmm. You truly feel connected in a way, like where you're basically, and I'm not taking credit for saying this or thinking it. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is a, in a lot of different books, I mean, which, which, where I, which, with which I agree, that in order to truly not feel alienated relative to the world, mm-hmm. I mean, the antidote to that is finding love. And, and most importantly, 
preferably with one person, but even just having that orientation of love yeah. is, is a key element of it. Because believing that you're going to receive it, in other words, believing it? Are you talking um, about it's, it's, like, it, it, um, what is it, thinking in abundance? It's... Uh, um, I mean, that, that's that's part of it. I mean, I think it's there is almost kind of an optimism that comes with an orientation of love toward the world, meaning that when you look at the world, your instinct is not just to assume that things are bad, troubling, problematic, but to but that there are people out there that are tr- can be truly themselves, that can be truly unguarded, and you look for that. You're looking for the best in those people, what if all and then when are- you find somebody in particular that you where, where that gets taken to this whole other level and that's, you know. What if they're all taken though? I mean, there's this, there's this common lament in women my age who are say, you know, 40 and up. Let's keep the range. I'm not going to get into details. And they, they do say that they think all the good guys are gone. I don't think that that's true. Um, but you know, the, another thing that you said about. What what do you think they mean by good guys? Like what are they, what's really their filter when they say stuff like that? Well, I'm not them, so I can't speak on behalf of all women of the world, but the things that I've read that they've said or my individual um, relationships with women have told me, uh, the guys that are consistent, that are actually going to show up and who are actually going to, I like to use the word adore them. I know some of my male friends roll their eyes when I say that, but what's wrong with wanting to be adored? I want to be adored. You know, it's like, you ever read um, Love at Goon Park by Harry Harlow, the Harry Harlow experiments? Mm. So just briefly, because I know we're running close to time here. Um, he had this experiment with um, monkeys, and they had lost their mothers. These are orphaned monkeys, I believe. And he wanted to teach them love. And I think there was other things. It's been a long time since I studied this. But basically, in his laboratory, these monkeys were just dying from lack of love, that literally dying from lack of love. And I think there's a lot of people out there in this world that we see in certain actions. If we really look into why they're dying, probably a lack of love is at the core of it. Um, a lot of violence we see is probably some of that. Not making excuses for it, but people not feeling loved. And these monkeys, so he decided that he was going to create a false mother for them. And there's these videos. It's heartbreaking to watch. And this is part of my undergrad degree. Um, they had this cold scientific room, and they put these mechanical monkeys in there, and they put um, a a bottle onto it so the monkeys could go over to the bottle and feed but then if i'm remembering this correctly they um weren't hugging it it was just a cold metal mother so they wrapped it in like carpet and cloth and these little tiny monkeys who'd lost their mothers were clinging to this soft thing it's the most heartbreaking thing to see and so he wrote a book and all the packages that would show up at his office which was 600 north um the the post office thought it was goon Uh because of the way they did the six and so he titled the book love at goon park with the whole series of experiments as the harry harlow cloth mother cloth mother experiments and so it's just an animal model for what we all really want you know from that basic creature level we want you know love and consistency right right but unfortunately what is what very naturally happens, because all of us live lives where we're constantly divided internally, mm-hmm. where we know that there's like this outward world that's impressed by looks and money and status. You said and earlier. Success. You said earlier though that attraction is important. Yeah, you didn't say it that way, but physical attraction has to be part of it, does it not? You can't. Can you love someone that you are absolutely physically repulsed by? Like they they don't. Well, that's keep a them- pretty strong. Right, but but okay, physically repulsed by is like right. But what if they're a really good person, but they never shower, or yes, that's a problem. That's a problem, isn't it? But I think you're looking at edge cases. I I, I think what really edge cases. I think what really happens is that people, you know, change their filter substantially, Mm -hmm. uh, and and like you know, you just use this the example uh, of of the monkeys not having love. Yeah. So what if you know the, those monkeys are not like seeking love only from the best looking mother monkeys they're not seeking love from only the wealthiest mother monkeys right no. like like it's the it's it's the connection that that's most important and look my challenge for people and i've seen this over and over in my life and and again i understand like everybody has has this internal contradiction i want to be with someone that that's impressive and whatever like we all like want to gravitate toward that but the truth is there's a whole world and a much and, and a large world of people who are really good people and maybe they don't look quite the way you envisioned them in a you know, in your dream or, or or based on 
you know, too many Hallmark movies. Maybe <laughs> they're not exactly the age you thought. Maybe they don't have the family situation. I know many people, for instance, they're, you know, will say, oh, well, no, I mean, I don't want to date someone that's divorced or like they have all sorts of rules. They have that checklist. Right? Yes. And, and and I'm not saying that you can't have rules that you can't. It's like, like, it's like but, the but, Hallmark meme. Have you seen but, the Hallmark meme where it says, like, here's a note to all you lawyers and accomplished guys out there. You're going to go home this winter to see your girlfriend and some guy in a flannel shirt's going to come up looking all dashing and steal her. <laughs> right. And, because, and that's ridiculous. It right? Is ridiculous. I mean, and I'm not saying just to be very <laughs> Probably clear, happens, though. I, I'm not saying that people should lower their standards. I'm mm-hmm. saying that in my opinion, you expand and look, it's, your standards. it's yes, it's change your standards to much more real things. Yes. Again, you know, going back up. Yes. I'm very happy and lucky that, you know, Katie happens to good, look, look good and yes, yeah, she, great. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. But the parts that really make our marriage worthwhile, the yeah. parts that uh, allow me to feel like truly loved, the, the part that is enabling for our kids to mm-hmm. feel truly loved. Those aren't the parts of her. It's not her looks and it's not, you know, her career. Yeah. Uh, it's the it's fact that she has a capacity to love. Yeah. And and oftentimes people, I think, are cutting themselves off from people who could be truly loving. Because, by the way, I mean, in certain ways, like the people who probably have the highest capacity for love are people who may have not be the the hottest, the richest, oh, or whatever. Because sure those people, you know, I'm um, sure of it. Do you remember ex- young worked Franken- on other aspects of their lives? Well, do you remember one of my favorite movies? Is I know we're really running over time, but one of my favorite movies is Young Frankenstein, the Gene Wilder version. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, he builds the monster and he tells Terry Gar, like, I'm going in there. The monster is upset. He's crying. He's been misunderstood by the whole world. And of course, he looks, you know, scary. He's, you know, he's got like bolts in his neck and scar on his forehead. He's stitched up and stuff. Scary. And the thing, I I love this movie so much. Um, There's this scene and he, Gene Wilder goes up to Terry Gar and he says, I'm going in. Whatever you do. Do not open this door. I don't care if I scream bloody hell. Do not open this door. And then, you know, there's three women there and the little EOR guy. And he's like, okay, we won't go in. So the monster's crying. He's on the bed. He knows that the world doesn't love him because of the way he looks and the way he acts and the way he can't really speak. And he kind of groans, you know. And Gene Wilder's like this tiny little man. And he goes in there. And, you know, the guy's, the monster's crying. And then he starts telling him, you're a good boy. You're a good, good boy. And you want to talk about physical strength? Let's look at you. You're so strong. And the monster starts going, oh, I do look strong. I am strong. And he's like reinforcing him and making him feel really good. And then the scene ends, you know, with him holding him and, and crying and like making him feel loved. And then the monster suddenly gets angry at how he's been wronged by the world and he wants to get out. And Gene Wilder goes, open the door, open the bubble, you know, like a lot of curse word door, like won't let him out. But I've always loved that scene because to me, it encapsulates your idea that it is what you are inside and how you are um, treating others. Your intentions matter so, so much. Katie had good intentions. She wasn't trying to pull some wool over your eyes to get you to give her you know, a big rock. She really was interested in you. And your, your grandparents, my God, to like survive Siberia and fall in love in barbed wire like environment. It's pretty deep modeling of, of love that you have. I am fortunate that I had, you know, two grandparents that really loving relationship didn't happen with my parents. Um, I think they're in a good space now. But growing up, it taught me the the arguing that they did taught me what to tolerate and to think of as the norm. I went through therapy to learn that I did tolerate and I'm very patient with improper behavior because it was what my norm was growing up. And I've tried to not have my children learn that that as a model and that me getting free from the marriage I had showed my children what your boundaries are, what real love looks like. And like you said about, you know, our kids, like they may not always love us, but I'm always going to love them. I think for me, the hardest part is finding the person who's one good enough for my kids. I want somebody that will love them, really love them. And I know I have the capacity to really love someone else's kids. I know that. But then to find someone that wants to look deeply into me and wants to not have, like my ex-husband did, check off the boxes, I'm a placeholder, that sort of thing. So it's a hard, it's a hard thing to find. It is. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll end on this note, uh, just because we're talking so much about love and finding love and how important it is. And it is, but, but a couple things to note. One uh, it's definitely way worse to be with the wrong person than to be alone. So I don't yes. want anyone to, I'm, I'm to, happy alone to, right to, now. to think otherwise. Yes. I mean, it is. I am very happy alone. I don't want that to be misconstrued. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, so that's, uh, so 
pretending, you know, to be with someone or pretending you're in love is is way worse than than. than it's than, a form than of hell single. on earth. I lived it. Right. So yeah, so, never so, again. so so that's one thing. Um, but you know, I, I think the second part of the message, you know, from my perspective, really is okay. Everyone, you know, think deeply about you know who you are. The, maybe think about the best people in your life. Odds are you're going to think of people who are not necessarily the richest and the best looking. Right. And, and and in many ways, that's the filter that's constantly sort of pushed on or, or that's kind of the, the, the set of judgments that's constantly pushed on us. And people really ought to uh, think a little differently uh, because to me, finding somebody who truly sees love as something that's critical to themselves, who've practiced it, who are night, you know, just like good, decent people. Uh, those are the people that are worthy of, of, of trying to find love with. And, and for people who do that, I, well, for, for people who are willing to see the world in that wider sense, I think the number of choices for them is, is going to be much more. And I wish them all the luck in the world in finding the right person because it's, it's worth it. Yeah, I think so. And it's a really great uh, note to end on. And I'll just say to the audience, like, Alex is one of my closest friends, and he he and his wife know that I love them and their entire family very much. So, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure to be here.